Okay, so we're in section uh, 15.4 now. We're going to be looking at applications of double integrals. And uh, this section covers more applications than we're going to concern ourselves with. Um, in fact, uh, we're really just sticking to the first couple of applications in this section. Um, not that the others aren't important or interesting, but this is kind of the... Um, uh, the minimal that we need to cover in this section. So we're going to start with um, a topic that you actually have discussed already in Calculus 2, the question of density and mass of a lamina. And we're going to use this to also talk about center of mass, or centroid is the other term for that. So um, what we're going to be looking at here are these um, things called laminas, which are, um, we, we like to think of them as plates. Uh, a plate with a two-dimensional um, surface and then uh, technically these things you can think of as being three-dimensional but having um, kind of a uniform small thickness um, that we're not seeing in this picture um, so we, we sort of think of these as two-dimensional even though they don't have to be um, now in calculus 2 you talked about how to take um, a lamina of uniform density um, and then determine the center of mass of that lamina. And where this differs now, um, and where we need the uh, techniques of calculus three and, and double integrals, is we're now going to assume that the density is not uniform, meaning the density of this thing can vary at different points um, within this lamina. And in order to make that a little bit more precise, we're gonna assume that the density of uh, of this lamina at any given point x, y is given by the function rho, it's the Greek letter rho of x, y. Now the problem with that, uh, if, if we were to just leave it there, is that um, technically a single point doesn't really have mass, it doesn't, you can't assign a density to something with no mass. So we can't really talk about density at individual points, but we can think of them in terms of limits. So if you think of what density is, uh, density is a mass divided by an area, so that it represents um, the amount of mass per unit area for some, some material, some in this case lamina. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take our lamina D, and kind of like we did in section 15.2, we're going to enclose it in a rectangle, um, and then we're going to... Uh, partition that rectangle up into these little sub rectangles. Um, if I take a look at the R I J -th rectangle in this partition here, because that um, rectangle contains area, then uh, if this if this um, lamina has some function giving me density, that little sub rectangle will have a mass, maybe a small mass, but a mass nonetheless. So if that uh, if that rectangle contains this point x i j star y i j star, then I want to think of the density at that point as being the density of this rectangle, this little sub rectangle, as it shrinks down towards that point. So that's essentially what this limit is describing. Um, it's the uh, limit uh, of um, delta m over delta a, where delta m represents the mass of that rectangular piece of our lamina. Delta A represents the area of that little subrectangle. And if we take the limit as the dimensions on that rectangle shrink to zero, the height and width uh, shrink towards zero, then that limit will go to um, some non-zero finite number if it has density there, and we define that to be our density function. Now we don't need to use this definition explicitly because in all the problems that we're gonna encounter, we're gonna be given either a description or an exact function for uh, row of x, y. Um, but I want to use this to sort of derive our technique. So again, um, this is how we define the uh, density at a point for a lamina like this. And if, if, um, if delta A is small enough, then this ratio will give us an approximation to this density. So, uh, if I were to assume that delta is small, delta A is very, very small, and use that approximation, I can solve this for delta M and say that delta M, which again is the mass of that subrectangle, is approximately my density function times delta A, the area of that subrectangle. Now, if I were to take this larger rectangle here, 
and for each of its subrectangles, get an approximation like this for the mass of each little subrectangle. Um, in addition, if I define any points that are outside of the lamina but within this larger rectangle to have a density of zero, that's going to give them all a mass of zero so that the only mass in question is going to be the mass, uh, uh, the um, points that are within the lamina itself. Um, this double sum here represents me taking this approximation for every uh, sub-rectangle in this um, larger rectangle here. So if I were to sum all those approximations, what I should be getting is an approximation to the total mass of the lamina itself. Um, and then as you would expect, if we were to take the limit as the number of subrectangles goes to infinity, that's going to shrink each subrectangle closer and closer to that point, meaning the approximation is getting better and better. And we expect in the limiting case that we get an exact um, mass for that density. So, or sorry, for that lamina. So that's where we get this, our formula for computing the mass of a lamina d given a density function rho of xy. And you can see it's just a double Riemann sum where the delta a becomes dA, our rho of xij star, yij star becomes rho of xy. Um, and that's that's all there is to it. Now let's, let's take an, another example from physics and apply the same thing. The, um, uh, let me go back here for a second. So the delta m that I talked about here represents the mass of uh, a rectangle, one of these little sub-rectangles over this lamina. But there's other quantities that we could assign to one of these sub-rectangles. Um, another example that uses essentially the same setup doesn't assign a mass, but assigns an electrical charge to that sub-rectangle. So if we have a lamina D, for example, and an electrical charge has been applied to it. That charge is distributed over that entire lamina, but the charge may not be uniformly distributed, meaning it may have, uh, it may have different measures of charge. We'll talk about how do we measure charge in a second um, at different points within that lamina. So the electrical charge function or electrical density function is um, uh, a charge density, sorry, we call it charge density, is a similar concept as this function rho of xy. We uh, represent it this way, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's essentially the same idea, and so it leads to a very similar um, double integral. So if we have a charge density function, um, which represents electrical charge per unit area, at the point x, y, then we use a capital Q to denote the total charge over that entire lamina, the, the total electrical charge. Um, and it's found the same way that we found the mass of a lamina. So we're gonna do a problem where we wanna find the electrical charge distributed over the unit disk um, with a particular charge density function. So that's, that's what we're asked to do here. Electrical charge is distributed over the, the disk. X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to one. That's the unit disk. So that the charge density at the point X, Y is given by this function, square root of X squared plus Y squared. And um, the uh, measurement for charge we call coulombs. It's from uh, physics. You may have learned that if you're in physics or have taken physics. Uh, charge density, remember it's charge uh, over area. So the units here would be coulombs per meter squared we want to find the total charge on the disk. So as always, you want to draw a graph representing the region that we're going to end up integrating over, in this case, the lamina. So this is my disk D. It's a unit disk, so it has a radius of one. Um, and we also have a density function, which we'll use in a second. Um, if you notice the density function is, has an x squared plus y squared in it, and the lamina itself is circular. This is a perfect example of where we would want to use polar coordinates instead of trying to um, integrate with just the standard rectangular coordinates. It's much, much easier if we go, go to polar. So remember, what we want is uh, an integral, a double integral, over this lamina of our charge density function dA. Now, if I'm going to go to polar coordinates, I have to think of what this function looks like in polar. Right now, it's not in polar. In polar coordinates, we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And so this becomes the square root of r squared, or just r. Okay, 
I also need to come up with limits of integration for my double integral. So if we think about the set, the lamina D in terms of polar coordinates, it's the set of all R theta such that R, well, if, it's, if a point is in the unit disk, then R would be somewhere between zero and one. So R takes values between zero and one. Theta can be anywhere from zero to two pi. This disk goes through all four quadrants, uh, zero, to 2 pi here. Okay, so that those become my limits of integration. 0 to 2 pi, uh, and then I have 0 to 1. And again, remember my charge density function, even though it looked like the square root of x squared plus y squared, um, in, in polar coordinates would just look like r. Okay, and then remember dA becomes r dr d theta. So this is really an r squared now, and the integration is pretty easy from here. I'm going to split this up into two integrals. I have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of just my d theta, and then the integral from 0 to 1 of r squared dr. Okay, um, This integral is going to just come out to 2 pi. This integral here, um, r cubed over 3 is my antiderivative from zero to one, that's gonna become one third. And I can write that as two pi over three. And because we're looking at total charge now, um, the result is not the same as a density. It's a total charge, which would just be measured in coulombs. I use a capital C for the units there, okay? So that's that, that's pretty straightforward. Um, again, polar coordinates were definitely the way to go for that one. All right, now if you think back to calculus two, um, you talk about moments and centers of mass. Um, and this this actually comes from chapter 8, this image. And it's how we define moments. So just to give you a little uh, recap on that. If you have a... Um, if you have a system of masses that are concentrated at points, so I'm going to imagine these three masses that being as being concentrated at singular little points here and here. Um, we define uh, the moment for each one of these masses to be the mass times the distance measured relative to some axis. So I can say that the uh, moment for um, m1 relative to the y-axis would be x1 times m1 because x1 is its distance, if this is the point x1, y1 right here, uh, it's its distance from the y-axis, m1 is its mass. And then similarly here, um, the, the moment of m3 relative to the, or about the y-axis, is m3 times x3. And then similar for, you know, moments about the x-axis, the uh, moment of this mass right here, m2, about the um, x-axis is y2, that's its distance from that axis, times m2. Those are the moments for each of these individual masses, but if we consider all three of these masses as part of a system of masses um, for one, you know, one, one object that we want to include them all in, then we can talk about the, ma the um, moments of the system relative to either axis. And really what those moments are is it's in a sense a measure of the tendency of this system to rotate about that axis. If you can imagine all of these um, three masses as lying across like a, a big plank that's being, um, that was placed on the y-axis. If these masses are heavy enough, then they, uh, they may um, cause the plank to rotate this way, you know, into the first and fourth quadrants. Um, so uh, we define the mass or the moment of the entire system about the y-axis to be the sum of each of the individual moments um, about the y-axis. And so that's what this represents right here. Notice that each one of those moments looks like m something times x something. Those are each of those moments. Adding them all up gives me the moment of the system about the y-axis. Similar definition for the moment about the x-axis. Okay. Now, um, in calculus uh, two, we talk about using this concept where instead of a finite number of moments like this, we have some region in the xy plane. And a region in the xy plane would consist of an infinite number of uh, 
points, each of which has a, a mass kind of assigned to it, or really a density assigned to it, similar to how we did in the previous example. Um, we use that to, to uh, come up with centers of mass in calculus too, but the uh, again, the assumption there is that the density of that lamina is uniform, it's constant. It doesn't vary from point to point. And here, now, we can allow for that varying of density from point to point. Um, I'm running out of time in this video, so I'm going to talk about where we get the definitions for um, moments about an entire lamina, um, and then leading to center of mass in the next video.